everyone. Good evening. Our next guest tonight is going to talk about why believing is achieving. How does a boy at 11 say he's going to go to the Super Bowl and 15 years later achieve that? How is leadership and serving the community a part of tonight's guest message? We're going to talk about that and much, much more tonight. And tonight's Reawaken You. I'm going to encourage you to visualize and feel what it is that you want to achieve. We'll ask Perry about that tonight, but I think it's really important to see things happening because if you visualize it, that can help you achieve it. So this week, what is it that you want to accomplish? Take a few minutes, sit quietly, and visualize and feel the feeling that it you would have if you accomplished something. Take time to do that, and we'll see what you do next week. Tonight's uh, episode is sponsored by Emily Parks from Organized for Success. Organized for Success specializes in productivity and technology for small businesses for both PC and Mac. They utilize technology and business organization systems to help clients increase efficiency and output by creating customized plans to incorporate into daily operations. Organized for Success provides one-on-one -on -one and team consulting in person and via Skype, customized workshops and trainings, workflow processes, and professional organization of physical workspace throughout North Carolina. And you'll see the ad with Emily there in yellow. A click, it'll take you on all her classes. And her website is organizedforsuccess.biz. And Emily has been generous enough for her classes now until the beginning of next year. If with you take, you will save money with the code RYB. And again, that's any classes coming up, and I'd encourage you to check it out. She's currently doing classes in Raleigh, Durham, and Triangle area of North Carolina, but next year she's going to be going to online classes, so bookmark organizedforsuccess.biz so you can find out more information. All right, we're going to tell you about tonight's guest. Perry Williams played for the New York Giants for 11 years and earned two Super Bowl rings. He has been the Director of Outreach Programs for Continuing Studies at Farley Dickinson University since 1995. Perry is also an adjunct professor at the school teaching leadership and ethic courses. Perry Williams has been a keynote speaker at the Outreach Program Banquet for Exxon, addressed the UPS team on leadership skills, and spoken to the Verizon Sales Division on teamwork. He has also addressed numerous younger audiences on similar topics geared towards school-aged children. Perry is heavily involved in the community, with a focus on sports and children, including the Perry Williams Three Sports Challenge YMCA Outreach Program, keynote speaker at the State of New Jersey's Governor Urban Youth Summit, who Will I Be, and is a guest speaker for Hoboken Head Start on the importance of father-male guardian involvement in school and life. Welcome, Perry. Uh, thank you have, for having me, Julie. We are excited. I heard Perry speak at a women's luncheon, and I said, hey, I've got to have you on my show because you are so inspiring. And if there is a quote on football, I guarantee you that Perry Williams knows it. <laughs> So let's get started. I want you to talk briefly about your background. Uh, there's a lot here. Growing up in the South, the South had just started desegregation when you were in school. You yes. ended up meeting a guy that's like, you got to meet my dad. So tell us a little bit about how your the circumstances of your youth. Well, as you know, I, as I stated to you before, I'm from Hamlet, North Carolina, Richmond County. Um, I grew up down there my grade school years um, from there. I, I started out in, like many young kids in the sports at the age of 10 years old. Uh, I enjoyed sports. Uh, I was introduced to the game by a classmate's father um, that was a little league coach in my town at the time. And uh, I just really enjoyed playing the game. Uh, got involved. Um, and my, at first, my mom and my grandmother, well, especially my mother, she didn't want me to get engaged in sports, because, especially football, because she thought I would get hurt and she didn't have the money to pay for medical expenses. But nevertheless, my grandmother kind of nudged on and said, let him go and you know, it'll be a good thing for him. And, and I got involved. Um, it took me from Little League through middle school through high school, Richmond Senior High. I graduated from there in 1979. Uh, I had a full scholarship at North Carolina State University. Uh, came here at NC State, uh, 1979 to 83. Also, I, I had a dual scholarship, Julie. I had a scholarship in track and field as well as football. So I uh, went through those process, and uh, when you know anything, 1983 had rolled around, and I was playing for the New York, got drafted by the New York Football Giants and played there for 11 years. Uh, the thing that I, I talk about a lot, Julie, you've heard me say this, uh, the believing is achieving. That is my motto. I believe that if you believe in yourself and anything is possible. Uh, I believed in it. I started out with the story. Uh, I call it the toilet bowl story. 
Uh, when I was 11 years old, I told my mom and my grandmother that one day I was going to be somebody. I was going to make something happen in my life. And with that in mind, I was, I was telling them about football and that I was going to play in the NFL. And not only was I going to play in the NFL, I was going to even play in the Super Bowl. So I remember this one, distinctly one particular day, my mom and grandmother was talking to him. My grandmother told my mother, said, you hear this kid talking about he's going to play pro football and be in the NFL, talking about playing in the Super Bowl. So the only kind of Super Bowl he'll end up playing is the toilet bowl. <laughs> so they laughed about it, of course. But I remember distinctly telling my mother and my grandmother that one day it would happen. So 14, 15 years later, my dream became a reality. I'll, and uh, I was ended up, and I played in my first Super Bowl, 1987. So. Which is amazing. But talk to us about that because when you first said that at 11, not a lot of kids have that determination to say, I want to make it to the Super Bowl and I'm going to do that. And you believed in yourself. Yet you had people around you who didn't support you. So what do you think it is about you or did you learn it from a mentor that allowed you to focus and believe so much in yourself? Well, it was a combination of things. My mother and my grandmother are obviously instrumental in my life. And even I, my uncle here, my have my mother's brother. He was instrumental in helping me out and encouraging me to believe in myself. And anybody the positive reinforcing of my peers and uh, coaches and teachers and a host of other people, you know, I just try to stay in the inner circle of positivity. Uh, if you believe in yourself and you believe in being around the positivity, then it becomes the uh, uh, end result of the things that happen a lot of times. Uh, I believe if you're around negative people, then you end up being a negative person. And so I, I don't believe in negativity. I believe in positivity. I believe that anything is possible. And I guess I'm a living example of it. I just believed in myself. I never gave up. I felt like quitting many times, like any other person. I'm a human being. But at the same token, I just kept you know, hanging in there, and it worked out for me. So what would you do to get over those humps or those big challenges when you felt like quitting? Well, I, was, I had a guy, which was my mentor at that time, a little league coach, uh, Coach Charlie Bishop. Uh, he was a great football player himself. He played at East Carolina University in the 50s. And as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, he was inducted in the Hall of, East Carolina Hall of Fame, Football Hall of Fame. Great guy. He's retired now out of Richmond County. He lives down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, he was a guy who... That um, he was, uh, you know, dedicated. He he believed in his in his young kids that he worked with, and, uh, and I just thought I bought into the concept, and uh, never turn, you know, never changed and never turned away from it, and just kept moving. And, you know, like many young kids now, you're talking about when I met him, 10, 11, 12 years old, I diverted, I got off the track a little bit, but at the same token, he would always get me back on the track and get me to start, you know, make sure I stayed positive and believed in myself, and talked about the teamwork concept. And, you know, if you don't have teamwork concept, you're not going to be very successful in any kind of sport. So I always believe in working as a team and having understanding each other's role and uh, just working together and have that winning edge. And what would you say to someone? And, it, you know, we talked about this prior to the show because you also work with children. Yes. You're teaching business people like myself. A lot of times, you know, people don't see the benefit of teamwork. They see, oh, you're my competition. But I believe you're stronger. You can work with your competition because you each have your unique traits and, and, and specialties. Like tonight's sponsor is Emily Parks, and yes. I do professional organizing. Well, Emily's the go-to gal for technology. I'm happy to help promote her. She does something completely different, okay. and she's great about that. But a lot of people don't see that. So what would you say to people who are maybe challenged in seeing the benefit of working as a team? Well, this, well the, the easiest thing that I can say is just look at the people who have had a lot of success, great success. That's all you got to do. You, know, you don't take a rocket scientist to figure, really figure this stuff out. You be around successful people, and every successful person I've ever met always had a host or a team of people that they work with, you know, and putting together and understanding each other's role. I think that's most important, understanding each other's role. If you understand your role and everybody got a, a role and work cohesively together, then you have a chance to be successful. If you have your own agenda and you want to do your own thing, you're not going to be very successful. And I've always believed in it, and I bought into that concept at early on, as I was stated to you earlier. You know, I won a state champ, little league championship. I won a state championship in my senior year in high school. I won an ACC championship in football when I got to NC State my freshman year. I won two Super Bowl rings. So I think I know a little <laughs> bit about having a winning edge. And I understand that it's a team effort. You can't, it's no I in team. Right. You gotta, it's, you know, you gotta be able, to be able to work cohesively together. And more important, I call it a double H. If you want to be successful in life in the workplace, in co corporate America, in education institution, or you want in the sports endeavors or whatever, have the double H mentality. And that's be hungry and stay humble. You know, I, I like call that. it, and I call it the double H. 
And if you can do that, then you, anything is possible and things are happening for you. And I've always believed in that. I'm a, I try to be a humble guy, um, and I always stayed hungry. Because if you're not hungry, then, you know, you're going to eat, you know, a lot of times you're going to get the short end of the stick. So I just always believed in myself and, you know, kept working hard. And my teammates that I play with and every level I ever played with, we all believed in us. And we became champions. You did. I should ask, do you have the Super Bowl ring on? We should. No, have. actually, it's not a Super Bowl <laughs> ring. It's my high school state championship, 1978 79, Richmond County. You know, I was the first class in 1978 79 to win the national the, uh, state championship in, uh, in the state of North Carolina from Richmond County. Um, my school was built in 1973, and by 78, I was the first class. Since then, Richmond County, if anybody know anything about Richmond County and Hamlet, Rockingham, North Carolina, they know that we got a great football pro, high school football program there. We've won probably 10, 11 state championships since my time. Uh, we've had 275 D1 players in college football, and we've had tw- over 20-something NFL players come out of my high school. Wow, that's really impressive because yeah. it's not that Richmond County's not that big. No, is we it? probably have 50,000, 60,000 people in the whole county. Yeah, but to have that many pro NFL players, you're kind of like Samoa or Troy Polamalu's from, right? Because they have a lot, they yeah, fo- right. emphasize football there, that's and right. they've had that's right. quite a few. As Perry knows, I, I disclosed I'm a Steeler fan, but <laughs> he knows Coach Bill Cower was a couple years ahead of him at NC State, there so there's that go. Steeler. We Steeler won't hold it against you. <laughs> won't hold it against me. Now you know Giants are okay. I root for you guys when anytime you're not not against the Steelers. Now I want to remind everyone: if you have a question for Perry, that's the one thing I love about this show. It's interactive because we want to make sure your questions are answered. You can chat it, and I'll be happy to ask Perry. You can call in at nine one nine five one eight nine seven seven three or computers two K Voice. And Perry, I wonder. You know, we always talk about that nature nurture thing. And there are probably, I'm sure, a lot of things in your life that you could have said, you know what, because I'm this or I'm that or this happened to me, I should not have succeeded. And yet you did. What would you say to someone out there who maybe thinks they're at a disadvantage or they're in a tough spot? What do you think it is about you that allowed you to to believe in yourself and achieve? Do you think you were born that way or it's you trained yourself to believe? What would you say to that? It's a combination of things, Julie. I I had people, mentors, I had people who was positive reinforcers, like a Charlie Bishop, uh, my grandmother, Annie Mormon, and she's now deceased, Annie Mormon DeBerry. Uh, I had my mother. I had my uncle, which is my uncle Paul Leach that lives here in Apex or the Holly Springs area outside of Raleigh here. People just kept giving me that feedback, that positive reinforcement feedback that you can do it, just keep hanging in there. And once you start hearing that enough times, then after a while you start believing that you can achieve something. And uh, I, I had, I've always had the mentality, once I learned that and understood that, don't quit, don't ever give up the Jim Vivano model that he used for many years. Coach V and I became friends when I came to NC State, uh, and especially when I went in the NFL. But I, I always tell people, just don't quit. I know it's going to be tough. It, you know, it's easy to quit. But it takes, mm-hmm. you know, it, it takes a special individual, man or woman, boy or girl, to hang in there when, it, in the, when the tough times are there. But um, I've always believed that if you could hang in there and just refuse to lose, refuse to be denied, then anything is possible. And I guess I'm a living example because, first and foremost, Julie, I hate to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that to the audience, to your fan base here. I, I, I despise losing, you know. Isn't it? Nobody remember losers. Everybody remember winners. And, 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 I, and I, I don't really say that to be cocky or conceited or arrogant. I'm just telling you that's a fact of life. You know, successful businessmen or women, they don't become successful because they accept losing. Mm-hmm. You know, losing, you know, to me, you know, a loser is a person who congregate and go in the corners a lot of times and point fingers and he did this or she did that and they don't like me and I don't like them or whatever. But true winners will come together and make it make that common code or that common cause and make it happen and, and become winners. And that's just the way it is. Now, what would you say to someone, because you said throughout your life you had mentors that, that helped you and were an important part to that. So what would you say to someone who doesn't have a mentor or would you have advice on how to, for well, someone to find a mentor? Well, that's, well, that's, you know, you try to find where that, it's like anything else in life. You know, you're as good as the people you surround yourself with. Okay, if you're in a negative environment, I don't care if you come from Section 8, if you come to projects, or if we say down south, the country projects, or the northern projects up in New York and New Jersey, where I made a lot of my work up there. Yeah, if you be around that positive person, then it, it, it rubs off. It becomes contagious. Um, I was saying that to Monka earlier this evening. You know, you've been around negativity. I mean, that's what's going to happen. 
you know, you got to be around positive people. And I know if you come from, you know, disadvantaged situation, I, I understand about humble beginnings. I come from a low income. I didn't have much money. My mother made, what, ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 a year uh, when I was growing up in a textile mill. But at the same token, I had positive people. And so you go find that positive. Everywhere in America, it's somewhere someone is positive. And so you go find in your community, in your in your in your uh, uh, necessarily in your, in your in your environment where you may live at, or in your state somewhere, you go find somebody that is positive, and then you go find that person and be around that kind of environment. I believe that. I also say often that in every moment you have a choice. You have a choice whether to find a positive person, or you have a choice whether to hang out with a negative person. And I yes. think a lot of times people say, I hear people say, "Well, I don't have a choice." I'm stuck in this job. I don't have a choice. And you're, you're making a choice by staying in that job. Exactly. And I believe that if people, that's one little thing, if they can make that switch and realize, okay, I do have a choice. I yeah. can choose what I want to do. Exactly. And that you do have control over your life, that that can make a difference. One of the things I really appreciate about you is your commitment to leadership and, and community. So let's talk a little bit about leadership and leadership development. What okay. does that mean to you? Well, leadership is leading by example. I mean, first and foremost, you know, you cannot be a successful leader or a great leader if you don't lead by example. You know, anybody can go out and tell someone, delegate to someone and tell them what to do. If you're not willing to roll up your sleeves and get and jump in the foxhole with that individual or individuals, then you're not going to have a lot of success. And I believe in that. And I've always said that about leadership. Uh, I define it as leadership, having an individual or individuals buying to one's concept. Uh, you know, the leadership is, you know, being able to uh, achieve one's purpose. Uh, those things are very vital and important to me. Um, I can only say again by my own example and the times and the things I've been able to do over the years to involve in my sports endeavors. And even after my life in the sports world, transitioning to the, back into the real world and my education components that I'm involved in at, at the university, Farrell Dickinson University in New Jersey. Um, you know, just going out there and working together, working with my uh, constituents there, working with my colleagues, working with the uh, administrators at the uh, all the board of trustees. And it's all about having a winning attitude and winning edge. We're all there for one cause. It's not about you and not about me. It's about the university. It's about the people or the, the cause that you're working towards. Do you think we can all become leaders or do we need to have some people that follow? Well, you know, I personally believe that anybody can become a leader. My, me personally, when I and use the example if I can, your analogy of a football analogy, I think about Harry Carson. I think about Lawrence Taylor. I think about Phil Sims. Harry Carson, great football player, played uh, for New York Giants many years. He was our team captain, played in the Hall of Fame, con- inducted a couple of years ago. Or Lawrence Taylor was a great player, played at the, that other school, Chapel Hill over there. You know, I'm being an NC State man, say the other school. But, um, but Chapel Hill, no, LT, they all led by example, but I, I led by example. You know, I was one of the quiet guys on the team, and yeah, I didn't get all the notoriety. You know, like some of these other guys on the field, Sims. Now, Phil Sims is a great commentator on NBC or ABC. It is now on TV, and I'm glad for him. He's doing great with his new life. Um, but I led by example. My work ethic, it was unmatched. Um, you know, my my commitment, uh, my attitude, and uh, it took me. You no, know, it's no secret, Julie. It took me for 11 years. Um, it was told to me by the New York football giants after I retired. That was one of the things, contributing factors of my longevity. Because I worked hard every day, I showed up, kept my mouth closed, stayed, kept my nose clean, stayed out of trouble, and went to work. And that's the attitude I had. Because it, it's, it's the old saying about the NFL. The old, now, you know, the acronym for the NFL, everybody says it's National Football League, but in reality, it stands for not for long. If you don't <laughs> produce, you're going home. So I knew I would, if I didn't produce in New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut, that metropolitan area, they were going to give me a one-way ticket back to Richmond County in North Carolina. And I didn't want no one-way ticket, so I did what I had to do to take care of business. Another thing that I love about hearing you speak is service is a huge part of your message, and you encourage others to serve. Why is that? Well, it's giving back. You know, I'm a believer in Christianity. I'm a spiritual in God. I grew up in the church. I uh, grew up in a Baptist church. You know, matter of Christianity is Christianity, spirituality. Um, I believe that it's better to give than receive. Uh, my grandmother, my mother taught me that. Even my uncle, you know, I was my uncle was a prime example. And I'm not saying that because he's here with me in the uh-huh. studio tonight. But I always watched him when I was a young boy and growing up. And then when I came up to college at NC State, things that he did with people, how he governed himself with others, or elderly people, or just people in general. 
you know, and I always trying to help other people, and you know, I want to do that. My grandmother was a big, big advocate for that and giving back. I always give back. How doesn't matter how much you achieve in life, you always be humble and and uh, give back. I mean, you know, going back into the reading of spirituality in the book of James, where it said God opposes the proud but give grace to the humble. You know, so I'm, I'm all about giving back. Um, you know, I, I was raised that way. It's part of my DNA. Um, you know, you can, uh, what is it? I think somewhere in the scripture, correct the answer, if I'm not mistaken, it say, well, what is it for a man and woman to profit the world? It's to, just to lose your soul. So, you know, I'm all about giving back. And I don't want to profit the world. And then all of a sudden, one day when my time comes, when I have to leave this place called Earth, that I have to face the big man someday, the upstairs man, and with, a, with the empty uh, resume. You know, I want to have something to show for. So, don't that, they say, give and you shall receive? Give and you shall receive. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. Now, I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Perry, we believe we missed a call. Call in at 919-518-9773. You can also Skype at Computers 2K Voice, and I'm monitoring the chat room. So if you have a question, here's your chance. I know we've got some football fans out there, and I'm not the only one. <laughs> Why do you think it is, Perry, I, you know, hearing you speak, doing some research about you, there are so many young men in the NFL today. I mean, I'm a... You know, Steelers fan. I'm also a Mountaineer fan. We had okay. Pac-Man Jones, who I believe murdered someone. We had another guy in the West Virginia team. And, you know, I mean, who committed serious crimes. You know, Ben Roethlisberger was charged with rape twice. And so what is it about you, or do you think it's because in the digital media age, but, you know, how come some of these young men or what the Hernandez who just – was arrested in the jail from the Patriots for murder. I mean, you're making millions of dollars a year. You've made it to this level that whatever you say, you have to be smart, you have to work hard, and it seems to be thrown away. So I would like your opinion on that, why you think that is or where they've gone wrong or if you'd have advice for someone coming up so they don't take that wrong path. First and foremost, Julie, the key words that I would say, about these, this new generation of kids and men and some of them, even in my time, not appreciative. Mm. They don't appreciate the opportunities. And, and I'm not saying because and I, I can't not blame these, these young men or young women. Uh, a lot of them from their foundation, they come from the infrastructure that they were raised in. I, I was raised in a, a humble beginnings in a, a blue-collar home. I uh, understood I was uh, uh, come from a single parent. My mother and my grandmother helped me, and as well as my uncle helped me along the way. So you yeah, didn't have a really a father. Father would say, say within, within the infrastructure of the house. But I just think it's not appreciative, not appreciative. Um, I was appreciative for my people. I will share this story with you. In 1983, I was drafted by the New York Football Giants coming out of NC State. Uh, when I got there, no, unbeknownst to me, uh, the general manager of the New York Giants, a great legendary executive, his name is George Young. He's now deceased. But George Young brought me in his office in the Meadowlands and set me down. He said, son, I know all about you. I know you're from Hamlet, North Carolina. I know you were obviously in NC State. I know your mother worked in a textile mill called Elio, and I know your grandmother helped your mother raise you. They said, well, nah, we want you to do these three things. If you can do these three things, you'll have a long career here in the New York Giants organization. Keep your nose clean, work hard, and do what the coaches ask you to do. And if you can do that, then you may have a job for a long period of time. And I took that to heart, and that was all I needed to hear, and I went to work because it was a golden opportunity. Where was I as a young man? I don't care if you graduated from college in 1983 with my degree in the criminal justice background with being a probation officer or whatever, what, $15,000 a year, $18,000 a year, and whether I can go to New York and make six figures. I mean, it wouldn't you know, take a rocket a scientist, Einstein, to figure that one out. Yeah, I was going to take the better pay. And so I gave you, I was given the opportunity. Now, what is happening now with this new generation of kids? As I say it again, and I, and I hope they take it to the league. If somebody watching this, you can take it to the league. The Paul, um, I guess it's not Paul Jackman, but Roger Cadell. Right. These kids don't appreciate it. They don't appreciate the opportunities that is presented to them. And uh, I don't know why that is the case. Maybe because there's so much money involved now, even more so than when I was playing. But at the same token, I don't care if it was one dollar, but and then it was a uh, million dollars. My thing was I had a job to do. I had made a commitment. My word is my word, my bond. Uh, I told the man that I was ready to go to work, and he gave me the opportunity, and and I went out there. Now another thing for me is the fear of failure. I didn't want to fail. What was I gonna go at? 
you know, if I didn't make it there, then I was going to have to come back to North Carolina and, and maybe start from scratch and try to get somewhere. And for I didn't want to be one of those guys of statistics. I wanted to be the one who went out there and made it happen and make the team and, and be a contributing factor to have the team have success. And I worked very hard for that. And so I had to sacrifice. A lot of kids don't want to sacrifice. They want all the glam, the, the riches, the big bright lights, and the hang out with the movie stars and all this and that. But then at the same token, you got to put time in for that. You know, that means going to bed at night, get your rest, mm -hmm. you got to eat, you, know, you got to do your work, you got to do a combination of things. So a lot of guys don't want to do, do that. So they just want the, the riches and the fame, give me the money, show me the money, man. Tell with the movie many years ago with, uh, with Tom Cruise and mm -hmm. Cuba Gooding, show me the money, but you show me the money, show me the results. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a strong advocate for the, for the NFL, for the ownership. You know, I know it's 32 teams now. When I was playing, it was 28. Uh, I'm a strong advocate for any of the professional team or the, or the ownership. You know, my thing is, and I've always said, is produce. I want the guys to produce. If you go play sports, you got to produce. You know, there's nobody want to look at, you know, see a loser. I mean, especially New York City. As I said early on, you cannot lose in New York. The media will eat you alive, and the fan base will run you out of town. They'll throw everything in the kitchen sink at you. So <laughs> I knew I had to produce when I went in. Yeah, I think the, the story with Lawrence Taylor and I, obviously Lawrence Taylor went to Chapel Hill, and I was at NC State, and I was several years behind him. But um, I remember my first year playing. Uh, I didn't really play my first year, but my second year as I became a uh, quote-unquote a starter. Uh, we was out there and getting ready to play the game, my first game as a starter in 84. And he said, you know, uh, and then we was in the huddle and getting ready to play the game. And he said, well, you know, this is not LACC football. This is the NFL. <laughs> if you don't produce, you know what that means. That means you're going to go home, not for long. So I, just, I took that at heart, and uh, I knew I had to work hard. And I wanted it. And we played, in my era, we paid for, for the championship. You know, the guys play, I don't know what they play for. Now, I guess they play, obviously, for the money, and then it's in the secondary, the, uh, the rings is, is secondary. For me, it was the rings was first, and then the money came. We, you know, we had the desire to play it. Play I want you to share the story when you were, I can't remember if you were in grade school or middle school. You had the opportunity to go to D.C., oh, but yeah. there was a conflict with the <laughs> sports event. And talk about that and what your coach said to you uh, and what you did. Yeah, well, it was now, I guess I must have been 12 years old. I had an aunt in Washington, D.C., my grandmother's sister, which is my great aunt. Um, she had come to visit in North Carolina, Richmond County, in Hamlet, and and at the end, and I was playing little league uh, all, uh, baseball. It was an all star team getting ready to start up at that time, and I wanted to go on a vacation. I had never been nowhere in my life to go on a vacation. And my aunt said, "Well, I'm going back to Washington. And I'll take you with me in a week or two, a couple of weeks, and we'll send you back on the train." And I was fine with me. I was happy to you know, get a chance to go to Washington D.C. Um, unfortunately, we still was in the midst of my season in baseball, in little league, and the coach, uh, the same gentleman, uh, called Charlie Bishop. Um, came out to the house, and he was upset. He said, son, you can't leave. You, this is a team effort. The team needs you, and we all need you to come, and we're going to work together, and we're going to stay together. And so he finally convinced me, and I realized that uh, it was a team effort. We all got to, you know, it's either we're going to go down as one or we're going to be successful as one. And I was convinced, and I guess what resonated with me, he said, you know what, I'll take you on vacation with my family. And so I had never been there. So we're going to Florida, so you go with us to Florida. And so with that in mind, I, I changed my mind, and, um, and I stayed. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I stayed, and, and it made me understand, you know, putting the team first and understanding mm -hmm. that it's not about me and understanding that, yeah, you could have other things going on in your life. You can put those things aside, and then you eventually can be able to do some things. So that not going to Washington, D.C., and then catching that train ride back a week or two later to a couple Super Bowls. So it worked well, out for me. I'm going to tweet and do some social media, and I think Goodell needs to hire you to speak to the NFL players of today. <laughs> you, you walk the walk, you talk the talk, but you live their lives. You know what they're going through, so you're someone that they can relate to. But, you know, there might be a player out there who you could make the difference whether they take the wrong path or the right path, which, you know, can make all the difference in the world. One thing when I heard you talk that I love, you suggest that we ask ourselves, what can I do to be a better person? Why? And is that something that you do every day? Yes, I live and breathe it every single day. You know, I've had a lot of great things happen to me in my life. I was telling you, as I said again, I was speaking with my uncle earlier without the eat. Over here in Cary, North Carolina, the uh, Golden Corral, and um, one of my favorite places mm -hmm. to go to see. Uh, but nevertheless, 
it's about you know just doing something that, that changing lives. Yeah, you know, I've had opportunities to do some things. People have helped me. You know, it's time to pay it forward. It's time to give back to somebody. And it doesn't matter how much you can uh, accumulate in life. If you if you can't feel good about yourself, that you know knowing that you did something for others and, and being a con, you know contributive factor to that, then you know life is worthwhile. Now, like Martin Luther King said, and I may if I may quote and say this, you know, paraphrase it anyway. Martin Luther King, where he said, "Well, what is it for a man?" You know, to go out there and profit the world just to lose his soul. But he also say, you know, I'd rather be a man of conviction than a man of conformity. Mm-hmm. You know, conformity mean being idle, sitting around doing nothing. You know, you're going to have a conviction in life. You know, you know, if a man hadn't found, and he also stated by paraphrasing this, that he said that if a man hadn't found something worth dying for in life, then maybe he's not fit to live at all anyways. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I found a call. I found a purpose in life to help others. You know, it's not about me. I've had a lot of opportunities. I've won Super Bowls. I've had things. I got clothes and shoes on my feet. I, mm-hmm. I got a place to sleep. You know, I, I eat every day. Um, you know, thank God he gave me a couple of other trinkets I have, you know, a couple of Super Bowl rings. So I'm, I feel good about myself. It ain't so, so much about me. It's about other people now. So that's why I live in my life. You know, I'm not worried about, you know, what I can do for me is what maybe I can do for someone else. I think we're all there. John F. Kennedy said many years ago, you know, that success have many fathers, but a, but a failure is an orphan. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I believe in that. Uh, you know, you have a little, you know, everybody, when you're successful, everybody want to be around you. Everybody want to love you. Everybody want to hug your neck and tell you how great you are, pat you on the back. But when you're at the bottom of the heap and you're not doing too well, you know, they treat you like an orphan. They don't want to see you, you know, that <laughs> in many ways, in many cases. So, you know, I just believe that uh, it's time to give back, and I'll continue to give back. Now, how have you remained so humble? I mean, you know, when you're at that level, you have women throwing themselves at you, people throwing money. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that would be a challenge because if you have people around you telling you how great you are constantly, you know, I think sometimes, and obviously we've seen people that buy into it. Now, it sounds like your mother, grandmother, probably Uncle Paul's in that mix, kept you <laughs> grounded and didn't let your head get too big. But was that part of it? Yes, you know, a combination of people, uh, you know, understanding who you, know, who you are and whose you are and understanding that your God is first and foremost the, the, the ruler. You know, and I understood that. Um, like anybody else now, I had my fun and I, I like to go out and I like to meet people. And I've had my little night life in New York City and New Jersey over my years, but I understand I, I modified and understood when it's time to be serious and it's the time to have fun and play and, and fool around. So when it was time to go to work, then I put all that nonsense to, to, to rest and put it to the side and, and took, you know, took care of business. And I was always, you know, uh, career orientated and in my business mind, you know, just to, uh, I guess straight and narrow, so to speak. I, I was all, not always on the straight and narrow. I mean, I got derailed. I got off track a couple of times, but uh, nothing that was detrimental. It, mm-hmm. it could have been bad. You know, I wasn't doing drugs. I never did drugs. Didn't the alcohol. I think the last alcohol beverage I had in 1979, I had a beer, a couple <laughs> beers. Uh, but when I was signed my scholarship, I, I never had another ounce of alcohol in my system since 1979. Um, I just think, uh, again, to answer your question, Julie, um, I just stayed humble and I understood, you know, you know what, you know, I'm here today, but I could be gone tomorrow. And take advantage of the opportunities that I have before me and be happy that you had the opportunity and give back and, and, and continue to do things to try to help others. You know, I've had my time. I had my two minutes of fame. Some people get five minutes. I got a, maybe two minutes of fame, and, and, and that's fine. You know, the thing is, I think I stated to you earlier before you went on the air here, um, some people have identity issues. Some people have self-esteem issues. You know, I don't, you know it's a culmination of things that can be related to that and why that's a, a tr- contributing factor. But uh, I've always believed in myself, and even though I come from a humble beginnings, that I knew I was, I was about somebody, I could be somebody. And uh, my philosophy is not how you begin, it's how you end anyways. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I started out at the bottom and uh, tried to give up and, and do something. Hopefully I'll be on the top. So my work is now just really begin, begun, I should say. Um, I did a lot of stuff in the sports world. Uh, I did a lot of things uh, since then, but still I got a lot of work to do. 
Um, and I continue to push forward and continue to try to change life. And uh, I got a call in there. I'm not going to get into the depth with the spirituality too much here tonight, but I can say this. Uh, the voice came to me some years ago and said, I want you to do this. I did not want to get involved with what I'm doing now. To tell you the honest truth, my background is criminal justice with a minor psychology. I told you earlier, I got a master's in public administration and concentration in business. And I was going to be an entrepreneur. I was going to be a little businessman when I got out of football. And a voice came to me and said, no, that's, that's what I want you to do. He's talking about the spiritual realm here. And this really, truly happened. And he said, I want you to go out and give back. I want you to work with young people. And I, and I didn't really want to use that, you know, uh, take heed to that voice. was answering a call to, to the bell, you know. And um, so I finally was, became submissive and gave in and understood that this is what I needed to do. And everything else has just taken off, skyrocketed since then. You've got to trust that. Talk a little bit about that. You don't have to go in depth, but because um, I've heard you speak before, faith and spirituality kind of, you know, you say whatever it is, whether you call it spirituality, where you call it faith, yeah. Christianity, that is a huge part of your life, and you yeah. believe it should be a part uh, of others. Why is that? Why do you think that's beneficial? Well, you know, it, it teaches you about being humble. It teaches you about being a, a cheerful giver. It teaches you a whole combination of things, and, and um, it's not about me. You know, it's about us. It's about the team aspect. Um, and I just believe that uh, spirituality has been being raised in the, in the spiritual confine and uh, infrastructure that helped me along the way. And I will share this story. And I'm, I don't very rarely share this story. I'm going to share this story on your show here, Julie. And I was talking to someone else today. I had a meeting I had to go to uh, early on in Raleigh today. Um, when I was in 1987, I had just won my first Super Bowl in the New York Giants. We had big uh, Denver Broncos and the great John Elway, that particular year, Pasadena, California, in the Rose Bowl. Well, that following season, we're getting ready for season, and I'm playing, in the, and we're playing in the season, and it, getting close to the end of the season, and I had a devastating blow. I hit a guy in a game. We're actually, we were playing against the New York football Jets. Uh, hit a guy, knocked him, tackled him, got him on the ground, but he got up, and I didn't get up, did not get up. Uh, I was paraplegic. From my neck down, I was paralyzed for, for about three to five minutes. Um, and then my whole world it re came revolved in, in, in an instantaneously in a moment that this is what can happen to you. And then all of a sudden, I told one of my teammates, a great football player we had named is Carl Banks from Michigan State University, that I can't move, Banksy. And I told him to take my mouthpiece out of my mouth and, you know, and I started believing and doing that. I started saying, you know what? This is what can happen to you when you start become selfish. When you start saying, okay, this is about me. You know, and then you forget about spirituality. You forget about God as the number one, first and foremost. Because the Bible tell you, put no man before me. And so anything. And so I was laying on the ground. I couldn't move. Couldn't do anything. And I closed my eyes and I asked God right then and there, well, if, I, if you get me off this ground in front of these 75,000 people in the giant stadium in the Meadowlands, that I would change my ways and I would now become, they start become selfish and arrogant and conceited. And I, as I felt, I was starting to become. Um, but within uh, five, maybe five to eight minutes, my, I started getting my feelings in my arms and my legs, and I was able. And then they did not let me get off of the ground there. They carted me off into the, the back of the locker room or back to the stadium, to the doctors. And, um, and I got up, and, and from then on, I didn't play, obviously, the rest of the game. But later on, then at the end of the season at that time anyway, so I was able to play for the next six years. That was my first five years. That right there was a, the, the telling story for me. You know, don't put nothing before me when spirituality, when God, the, the holy maker, the one who created everything, you know, you put nothing. You know, and I, and I realized then you can't be conceited, you can't be a selfish person even more. So and I was never really that way, right? mm -hmm. but I started feeling good about myself because the, the bright lights in the movie stars, you're meeting movie stars all of a sudden, that New York City can corrupt you, it can make you or break you. And I started, you know, feeling that way a little bit, getting beside myself, if, if you want to call it that. And, uh, and then God, put, you know, put me back in my place real quickly. We've got great sound effects here in the studio. <laughs> so you've talked about two H's, which I hadn't heard before, humble and hungry, which I like. I'm going to use those, and I'm going to quote you. <laughs> but you also have your three D's. Can you share those with us? Oh, the three D's. Uh, the three do nots. Three do nots. You know, do not be, do not quit anything you start. Do not let anyone outwork you. 
and do not be intimidated by anyone or anything. And so that's something I can tell you've lived your life by because yeah. cause of how your life is. Yes, yes. You know, I just believe in that. Uh, uh, I, I think about people like the Winston, great Winston Churchill. You know, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. Uh, Timothy Boltz in Proverbs, where he said, evil people get rich for the moment, but a good person rewards the last forever. Eleanor Roosevelt, when she once said that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of the dream. Uh, she also said, I maybe even Julie you was at that event when I spoke on uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, when she said about women is like a tea bag. She said, you never know how strong they are until you put them in hot water. That's so. for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, You've given us such such great things to think about tonight. I, what would you say to someone? I mean, I love that example that you shared with us, how you were paralyzed and, and you prayed and you could see in your mind that, you know, you're maybe starting down that wrong path. What would you say to someone? It might be a, a teenager. It might be a grown man. It might be anyone in a certain situations. If they're at a crossroads and maybe they're not going to have uh, a profound experience like you did, but is there any thoughts that you'd like to share with them if, you know, if they're potentially going down that wrong path, maybe your thoughts that would steer them in the right direction? Well, more importantly, just try to stay humble and, and try to be a, a cheerful giver. Try to help others. Try to, you know, try to help and love and care about other people. You know, and I just think that, that that's the most important thing. You know, it's not about the individual. You know, you don't have to be a movie star. The give. You don't have to be a professional athlete to give. You don't have to be, you know, singer, you know, or whatever to give. You can be an everyday person and give. You know, you know, you never know. I think um, um, the president Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, where he said, you know, you never know, you know, until you hit yourself up to something that is bigger than yourself and you realize your true potential. So mm -hmm. you got to hit yourself up to something and then stay focused, stay forward. And steadfast to it, and uh, make a dream become a reality. Just don't give up. Just don't quit. Um, we all have our challenges. You know, not everybody gonna be the the, the top dog, or everybody gonna be the top lady. Some, you know, that's old adage we say. You know, adage we, I've said many times uh, with Native American. And when, when we talk about, you know, I got some Native American in my blood, in my family. Uh, um, Everybody can't be the chief. Somebody got to be the Indian. So mm -hmm. I don't mind being the Indian. So that's fine with me. You know, my great-grandfather was a janitor. But what he told my mom was, you do everything, but you do it in excellence. And that's so, right. that's you right. know, some people might look down on that. But that's all right. But he, he did an excellent job, and he took yeah. care of his family. That's and, right. you know, he took pride in what he did. And so, like you say, you can be the Indians, but that being a janitor is an important job. We're all equal. We're that's all important. Right. There's no job that's more important than another one, but I sometimes don't think we see that. That's, that's, yeah, that's a great point you said that, Julie, because I say that about leadership. You know, you can take a man or a woman who's at the bottom. When I go to speaking engagements, I, I, I make it a, a point, I mean, at all costs most of the time, that I, if I'm at a banquet, I'm, I'm going to see the women and the men who work in the tables and the servers. I want to talk to them. I want to shake their hand. I want to, you know, tell them I thank them for the food. Or, you know, if they want an autograph or I sign a picture for I'll make time for them because if they're down there serving you. That don't mean that you got to treat them like they're servants. They're human beings like everybody else. And so I go from the top to bottom. I've met with CEOs and CFOs and presidents and all these different men and women. And they'll probably look at me like I'm crazy, but I get up and I go talk to the everyday people. Because if you don't treat those people right, you can never be a great leader. Absolutely. You know? And, and that's you know, how as I they at. say, the people you're meeting on the way up, you're going to meet, meet on, on the, the way, way down. Because right. you know what? You're not always going to be on the top. That's right. You know, that's right. Absolutely. My grandmother always said, God bless the dead. But she always said, you know, you never know who will give you the last drink of water, son. So you better, you know, try to treat everybody with respect. Which I can tell from the moment I met you, Perry was so humble. You're like, hey, I'm Perry Williams. I'm like, you're an NFL player. We got to talk. <laughs> but just that humbleness comes through in everything you do. And I want to remind you, if you have a question for Perry, chat it or call 919-518-9773 or Skype at Computers2K Voice. Why do you believe it starts with the mind, believing is achieving? Why does it start there? Well, the mind it controls the whole body. Your body, you can be physically inclined, and in the body, the physical tools, you can look like a Greek god. You know, some of these athletes, male and female. But if the mental aspect is not there, 
then you're not going to make it. I always say, I use that analogy all the time, that mind over matter. You know, if you don't think you can do it physically, then you're not going to do it. You might have all the physical tools in the world. If you're mentally not in, you know, on the same page and having that mindset on the positivity aspect of it, then you're not going to make it. And so, you know, I always say to young people or just people in general, learn how to impose your will on the situations. You got to learn how to impose your will. You know, steel will mentality. I call it the steel will mentality. If you don't have a steel will, man, I don't care if you're a businessman or woman or whatever. You can be whatever, a CEO of a company or president. You're going to have that self-esteem issues. You're going to have that identity crisis. Then you're going to be tipping on, walking on tulips, and you're wondering what's going to happen. That person not doing is talking about me and that person. If you, if you walk the chalk line and you do the right thing, then you're not going to have to worry about that because you're going to have a team effort. You're going to have a unified group, and you're going to have success. And that's mm-hmm. how this stuff works. And so, you know, it's, it don't take a rocket science again. As I said to your audience, to figure this out. You have a little common sense. If we say down south in North Carolina, we have a little mule sense. So just have a little mule sense and you'll be all right. What do you do to conquer doubt and criticism? Because we all get that, even if we have a lot of confidence and, and believe that we can, we all face that. So what would you say to that if someone's dealing with that right now? Let's repeat that again, please. So if... If you have doubt or criticism, how would you conquer that? Well, criticism, a lot of people, uh, when I say about criticism and doubt, I guess they uh, come to my mind, you know, misery loves company. When some people are miserable, or every, they want everybody to be miserable. You know, so my thing is I don't need no negativity. If you want to think about negativity, you go on that side of the room and I go on my side of the room. You know, and I go do what I do. And you, I guess that this old adage with these young kids, hey, they say, hey, Bonnie, you know, you do you and I'm going to do me. So mm-hmm. it's all about it. I'm not going to be around negativity. And uh, I was talking to my uncle again today. And I, bring, I keep bringing that up with my uncle early on. You know, we're talking about this this life and uh, endeavors and things in life and things you have to do. Um, I'm not going to, I just don't tolerate no, unnecessary nonsense. You know, if, you, if you're not coming to the table with the right stuff with, for me, uh, information, or resources, then it, it, you, you waste. You know, I'm wasting my time. My grandmother always said, "I use that as going back again. You can, you can do bad by yourself. You don't need no <laughs> dead weight. I don't need dead weight. You know, I'm already got enough on me as it is. So, you know, I just go believe in, you know, going out there and and, and working hard, uh, surrounding myself with positive people, people doubtful. You know, I try to encourage them, and I try to give what I, as I said early on, positive reinforcement. I keep saying, if I say it enough to someone, and they have doubts and, and not encouraged or have some issues, self-esteem issues, I keep saying it enough, but maybe this, it might take heave, and it might take hold, and they might start believing it. They maybe can achieve. And, you know, you're living, it, you know, living from my example, where if this guy comes from this situation, maybe I can do something. But mm-hmm. I just got to believe in myself. Who inspires you? Because I believe you inspire a lot of people. Who inspires you? <laughs> um, a lot of different people. You know, people. I, you know, I don't say it because my uncle's in my uncle inspired because I, I, I love the, for the things he's done. But he try to help people. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that, that that's you know that's positive reinforcement. That's reinforcing what my, what my belief is. Uh, uh, I, I, who inspired me? Uh, teachers. You know, educators. People who trying to help teach the young people the leaders for tomorrow you know people like yourself dude, i'm not just saying because i'm on your show you know try to pump your show mm-hmm. up i'm sure your show will be great anyways but the thing is uh people like yourself who has the mind and and the, and the wherewithal to be able to do what you do but you still want to help others and want to give back see that that's the beauty of this whole thing i want to infrastructure people like yourself and other people that i know that I can go to, and I, what I call them my soldiers. Mm-hmm. Now, a male of uh, my faithful soldiers, and then my women, I call them soldierettes. So I'm looking for soldierettes you know, to come in here. So that's, that's the kind of infrastructure that I want, and that's the kind of infrastructure that I know I have success with. And feel free, you can pump up the show anytime you want, Perry. <laughs> there, is, there is no limit to that on, on what you need to do. So tell us a little bit about the work you've done with kids, because I find that completely inspiring because I think this generation of kids really need it. And I um, read a great quote the other day, you know, talking to parents that how you first treat your child, that becomes their inner voice, which I think is so true. But you do a lot of work with kids. So talk a little bit about that. Well, I, uh, I enjoy, as I told you earlier, you know, a little while ago, a little while back, um, the voice came to me many, many years back and said that I want you to 
you know, this is your call. I want you to work with young people. Now, I didn't think I wanted to do that. I do a little bit. I give some time back when I'm doing my entrepreneurial stuff, and I just give a little time. But when it told me to go into it full force with all two feet and everything else I had, my body extremities to go in it and uh, things would work out, uh, once I got in and I realized that I had a story to tell, and I realized that these kids, you know, there's no disrespect to a corporate America or uh, businessman or woman, kids are impressionable. They love sports. They want to see these athletes that they, they, they idolize on TV and, and, and they want to hear their story. How did you get there? How did you do this? And so I've used that platform, my celebrity, from in the state of North Carolina, from being there, obviously. You know, how ironic was it for me to go to New York City? Out of all these NFL teams, I could have in there, Los Angeles, Seattle, Cleveland, Cincinnati, or uh, whomever. Or Pittsburgh or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, ironically, I ended up in the largest city in America. And that was by the grace of God, and in my opinion. You know, talk about spirituality. God put me there because he knew that was the biggest city and that was the biggest market. The biggest market that I could get exposure. Now, not only just to get exposure for the football aspect of but the platform. Where I told you early on before you went on the show tonight that at one point our U.S. Army was sponsoring a program throughout the country, and this is a marketing firm out of New Jersey that hired my services. I went to 30 major cities in the country, and I had uh, 1 million kids, and I covered those uh, uh, character education initiatives in a two year span. That's, that's wonderful. I think that's something we need. Now, Perry, there's a couple questions I like to each ask each guest that comes on. Oh, and the man. first one is, what would you say to someone out there who's just in a tough spot? They're struggling. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe a dream didn't come true. But they're just they're struggling right now. What advice would you have for them? Keep believing. Keep dreaming. Keep, just keep your vision. Refuse to quit. Refuse to lose. Refuse to be denied. Denied. Just stay in it. You know, I guess the old adage again, if it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. Life is not easy. Believe me, I've had some trials and tribulations, some ups and downs, you know, have my turmoil, have things that happen to me, even as I said um, in the beginning, in the middle, and even up to today, things happen, and we have tragedies and things happen in life, but you, you, you got you to gotta stay focused. You know, I think focus is a, it's a key component. Learn how to be focused. I know when the tough get going, and you know a lot of people want to fold the tent and give in and throw the flag in, but you got to be able to, just be, you know, persevere and, and stay with it and work hard and, and refuse to quit. As I said, uh, I guess Jimmy Valvano, his greatest motto, you know, his motto for his in the, the Jimmy V Foundation, you know, never give up. Just don't quit. You know, just don't quit. If you, if you don't quit, if you, then you can never lose if you don't quit. I think the, the greatest quote I read somewhere was Mike, Mike Dicker, the legendary football coach of Chicago Bears. He said, you're, you're never a quitter until you, when you, you, until you quit trying. When you quit trying, then you're a quitter. Mm -hmm. You're never a quitter. You don't quit. You, know? you just never lose. If we, you know, when you give up, then that's it. Then you lose. Absolutely. You know, it just comes to um, that Newt Rockman, the great legendary coach in Notre Dame many years ago. I read somewhere in his memoir of some books I read where he said that he loved bad losers because good losers lost too often. Now, what did that mean, Williams, what you're saying here? Well, when you go out there and you, give, and you think that you're going to lose and you think you're going to give up and you go ahead and quit, then you lost the game. You know, when you refuse to lose and you, you keep fighting because there's always going to be another day. The sun goes to shine tomorrow, eventually. It might be a rainy day today, but another day it's going to be bright. And you got to come back. You know, with Paul Bear Brown, University of Alabama, I read somewhere in his memoirs, where his biography, where he said that, you know, winning might not be everything, but it sure as heck be coming in second place. Who want to come in second place? You know, the bottom line is you want to win in your business, in your corporation, you presidents out there, you executives out there. You want to win. So you want to win, you got to go get the people to win with. You can't win, you know, it's an analogy that I use. You can't take a donkey to the Kentucky Derby and think you're going to win him. You got to have the thoroughbreds that take him to the Kentucky Derby. And that's how you're going to win. Okay, people? All right. All right. Now, the second question I like to ask is, you know, I do this show to motivate people and I want them to take action. So what one step would you say people could take right after the show or before they go to bed or tomorrow morning when they wake up to reawaken their brilliance? First and foremost, drop on your knees and give your, your blessing and say a prayer to God. If you don't know nothing about that, you know, start working on your spirituality realm. 
Start believing in that. Start giving back to it. You don't have to go in there and read the Bible all upside down, sideways and all that. Just start believing in a cause and stick with that cause and believe in it and stay with it. And then you'll see a, a magical change before your eyes because I'm a living example of it. And if you can do that, then anything is possible. Just believe in yourself and don't ever give up. You know, the, another thing that I say, you know, about motivation, I use the term, you heard me talk about this, Julie, when I say about motivation. Some people can stay motivated for a day. There are others who can stay motivated for a week. I've met many who can stay motivated for a month or so. But a true winner will stay motivated for what? As long as, long as it takes. Absolutely. Now tell people if they want to learn more about your speaking, you just had a pamphlet, where can they get more information? Or I know you have your your upcoming class that you're teaching at Farley Dickinson. Yeah. Any good stuff that you'd like to share? Well, yeah, I just gave you a pamphlet early on. If you want to know more about me, just call Julie, please, and she'll help, you, help me get any information to you that you need. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the, the, the crux of this whole thing. Julia's a great lady here. You guys keep on tuning in to her show. And, um, you know, I'm sure that if she can give you, you know, the information about me. I'm not hard to find. You know, Julia has my information. She got my email. Just email me, pwilliams at 023gmail.com. And um, we can go with it, and we can uh, make some changes. We make some things happen. You know, believing is achieving. Yeah. And Go ahead. I'm saying that you're at Farley Dickinson with yeah. their leadership and yes. ethics. So yeah. people are up in that area. And you said it's business people like myself that you're teaching. So if they're interested, they have you have graduate courses up yeah, there. Yeah, we have our graduate. There. Yeah, we have a graduate class. You want to go to graduate school? We have a, the administrative our curriculum that I'm involved in with the administrative science department. Ron Khaleesi is the, the chairman of that department. Uh, we have a, obviously we have people who want to go into sports management and sports administration. Uh, we have a graduate program level, undergraduate and graduate level set up there. I'm, I'm lecturing classes there, doing some classes in uh, leadership and management courses. Uh, so it's the culmination of things. So um, the, you know, I call it, as you see, uh, Julia, on my new brochures I just received off the press about a week ago. It, my my uh, new initiative is called The Experience. So if you want my experience and for my testimony, please, by all means, call me. We'll get you in touch if anyone calls. And I want you all to, I want to thank Perry and Uncle Paul, who's been hanging out in the studio tonight. <laughs> I give you Perry a shout-out. They had an unexpected death in their family. I just found out a couple of, uh, hours ago, and I said, Perry, you know, w- would have been fine. Life happens. But to- Charles, you what a, what a true true man to his word is. He said, no, you plan this. We're going to do it, and we'll go back and deal with family. So I want everyone to keep Perry and his family and their thoughts and prayers. You want to get a hold of Perry. You all know how to reach me and do that. I want to, again, thank Emily Parks of Organized for Success for sponsoring our show tonight. Sponsorship helps us upgrade equipment and do all these wonderful things so we can give you these amazing free programs here on Nissan Communications. You can click there and find out more information. And, again, with the code RYB, save money on any of Emily's classes. And if you look under the events, next Tuesday is our online class on um, Simplifying your life. We've got professional organizer and author Annie Robach, and we've got DPRAC Copra Train Deborah May, and we have author and international workshop leader Lisa Transcendence Brown. So find out more information. It's going to be recorded if you can't make it live. Again, if you need to simplify your life, please check it out next Tuesday. We'd love to have you. All right, everyone, I thank Perry, and we'll see you all next week. Bye now. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays, 9 a.m. till noon. Carrie's Psychic Cafe with Carrie Silkowski, Sundays, 8 till 9 p.m. Health In with Debbie Brooke, Mondays, 11 a.m. till noon. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays, 1 till 2 p.m. Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members the second and fourth Wednesday of each month from 7.30 till 8.30 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays, 9 till 10 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by thatvidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.